morning. Thank you for the warm welcome, and it's always such a great pleasure to come. I see old friends and new faces, and it's always such a great pleasure to be up here. And looking at the venue, it's such a great change that's happened over the years. Um, we're going to talk about uh, bears. So Exordium is a company that I founded that deals with nature, and I deal with uh, kids uh, all the way from pre-K all the way up to elder learning and youngsters like yourselves. So, uh, and I have a number of different programs and I thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you. Um, we're going to, so I'm going to have to be careful not to put my head down. Before we get going with the bear, for all of you that came in and saw the beaver skull, I have one question. Does anybody know how much a beaver's tooth grows in one year? Go ahead, Cherry. Four feet. Four feet. Correct answer. So for all of you that now said, what? There's a good trick question for the next time you have a beer, you know, beer bed or something. Four feet. So after the, after the thing, if we have some time, you can come up and I'll explain it to you. But today we're going to talk about the black bear. And the black bear is nature's voracious omnivore. Um, years ago, 25 million years ago, uh, the bear split uh, from the cana did, from the dog, right up here, and became a separate family. The bear dogs are now extinct, and the Ursidae are the ones that remain. And if we look at the platogram for the bear, we have the brown bear, which is the Ursus arctos, grizzly and Kodiak from there, and it's believed that the polar bear also came from the brown bear, but because it lived uh, near the sea, uh, it became the polar bear, Ursus maritimus. And uh, it was actually the black, the uh, Asian bear that uh, had the black bear from which the Ursus americanus, the black bear, came from. And uh, we know that uh, uh, 500,000 uh, years before the present, there were actually black bear or Asian bear bones found in Pennsylvania. So we know that the bear came from Asia across the land bridge at least that long ago. So we're going to delve into some of the history and some of the things that um, go with the black bear, but I wanted to just give you, there are three species of bear in North America. The polar bear, the brown bear, broken up into two uh, smaller groups, grizzly and kodiak, and then the black bear, which actually has 13 subspecies uh, throughout the, uh, the continent. Uh, how'd that do? Okay. So, the polar bear, this is a male polar bear, is the largest land carnivore, which is something that I'm not quite sure of because when we get further down, we'll see um, the, the brown bear or the Kodiak bear is pretty large as well. So the adult can sprint to 25 miles an hour and uh, it's a little more than half a ton, the largest, and the female much, much smaller. Um, and when the, when the bear stands, so just to give you, when it stands on its hind legs, it's six and a half feet tall, the polar bear. And uh, that's the female. And then the, it's eight feet. So that's much larger. So that's not something that I would want to uh, meet in the, dark, in the dark on the plains. And then four foot is when it's shoulder height. So that's, that bear is pretty big. Yeah. There's a, the polar bear lives primarily in the Arctic Circle around the globe in the snowy regions of the world. 
Then we have the Ursus Arctos Horribilis. And that's the grizzly bear. Obviously, that picture on the left, he's not that horribilis, is he? <laughs> so the grizzly, 3 to 3.5 at the shoulder, which is still pretty big, and a length of 7 feet. So, and uh, you can see the male much a lot smaller than the uh, than the uh, the polar bear, but still 800 pounds is nothing to contend with. And the top speed 10 miles an hour faster than the uh, polar bear, 33 miles an hour. Now it says lifespan 20 to 25 years. Um, that's in the best conditions. And if you're in a hunting range or something like that, it's much much less. Gesundheit. And then we have the Kodiak, Ursus Arctos Middendorfi, which is also from the brown bear. And uh, I mean, the, the picture on the right, you can see a group of bears, and they're pretty big. The other thing, too, is, and I'll mention this again later, both the polar and the brown bear or the Kodiak bear have a hump. The black bear does not. And these pictures here, uh, they're pretty good marketing, the way they set this up, because they get the hunter way back in the back. In the, but it is still a big bear, and I'll show you some of the stats. So male 600 to 1350, up to 1500, 10 feet in length. So this is where my tape will probably go. So that big. And, and uh, the largest one in the wild was 1,600. The largest one in captivity, over, two, over a ton. And an 18-inch hind foot. So he's buying shoes that some basketball players buy. But this is 18 inches. That's a heck of a footprint. And here's, uh, here's a Kodiak with his, uh, he's been uh, in captivity. He's 21 years old and he's with, uh, he does um, TV and movie uh, shows. He's been tamed. But we're gonna talk about the American black bear and a number of different topics um, to start off. Ursus Americanus. And it's, we're not going to touch on all 13. We're going to uh, concentrate on the eastern black bear. But you can see from the pictures, um, these bears have a variety of colors. And I'll touch on that a little more. But the one thing that you might notice is that they all have a tan muzzle except for the uh, one at the top that uh, is probably uh, a color, um, you know, colored. So the eastern black bear, a male, much larger, the female, smaller. Take a look at the faces and keep that in mind because we're going to touch on that. In the Nothing was known about bears for a long time until the 1960s when safe tranquilizing drugs were invented and became, uh, came into wide use. Because prior to that, um, the bear being a very secretive animal was never really seen. And with the tranquilizing drugs, we were able to put radio telemetry on them, collar them, and be able to follow them and find out what their hunting patterns were, their denning. And so we were able to track them much more closely. We could locate their dens, and as you'll see later on, there's a variety of dens that they, a variety of locations of where they put their dens. And importantly, we were able to do a population count and have vital statistics and see how healthy they were. And they employed something what, that was called cementum annuli, 
which is counting the growth rings in the tooth. So it was a much more accurate me uh, manner of being able to judge their age as opposed to any other method that they had. And of course, the reason we needed to do that is because as we, as a population grew and encroached on wild habitat, uh, created wind projects and gas pipelines, etc., uh, we needed to make sure that uh, we knew what the bears' um, habits were to minimize a conflict. And I live in Enosburg on the Water Tower Road about a mile and a half outside of town, and I've actually seen a bear going into town, halfway down. So they're around, they're just very quiet and shy until they come to your bird feeder. <laughs> so vital statistics. It's the smallest bear in North America, as you can see from the, from the slide, polar bear than the brown bear. And you can see up in the corner the different size of the, the feet as well. I do have a foot here uh, from a large um, black bear. So you can see, you know, relative to your head what it looks like. A full-grown male, up to 350 pounds. The female, much smaller, 180 pounds. And these bears have an average lifespan or a lifespan of 30 with an average of 20. But as I said, if they're hunted, anywhere from three to five, so much less. And the biggest one was shot in New Brunswick, um, estimated live weight because they didn't get it. They had a dress weight and then they sort of averaged it out and estimated it to be 1,100 pounds. And again, if you take the right camera shot, you can make an insect look huge. <laughs> This is a large bear, and the reason, of, I'm gonna give you the secret of how you can tell when you meet a bear whether he's large or not. <laughs> a large bear, all bears, their ears grow five inches. But if it's a large bear with a lot of fur, then those inches, those ears become, look much smaller. And the other thing is, if you draw a triangle between the two ears and the nose, it becomes an equilateral triangle. And I'll show you. Here's the small bear. See how much bigger the ears look? And see the triangle. Now remember when we talked about the cladogram, we said that the bear broke away from the canidid and died. And so the snout is very much a canine sort of snout. And up here I have bear, and I also have wolf and, or uh, coyote and fox, so that you can compare and look at the skulls. So now if I ask you the question, which one's the large bear? Correct. So the bear, uh, a black bear, up to three feet at the shoulder, which when you compare it to what we had with the other bears, is much less. And upright, it's six foot, which is approximately my height. So, much smaller than either the polar or the brown. And the running speed, uh, 33 miles an hour. And uh, a naturalist once said, when you see the bear running, it's like an animated bowling ball, because the faster he goes, the more he reaches forward with his back paws to pull himself. And so he actually, as that picture down there looks, like a bowling ball. And I actually have, later on, I actually have an animated thing so you can see a bear run. <laughs> Ten miles faster, pull over, buddy. <laughs> a bear is, uh, the black bear is also uh, very arboreal, um, meaning that he loves, he or she loves to take to the trees. If you come up and look at the bear's paws here, you can see that the front claws 
uh, are curled so that he can grasp the tree better. And what they do is just like you will understand, but kids don't understand anymore. People that worked on telephone poles, they used to have spikes on their shoes and a belt, and they put the spikes in and then push themselves up, keep pulling. That's exactly what a bear does. He puts the back paw spikes in, nails in, and then grips up and pulls up with the paws. So he can move those paws and keep pulling himself up. He also does, as you can see, rock walls. And amazingly, for a bear of that, or for an animal of that size, he can get up into very small branches because that's where the fruit is, or the, the nuts. To come down, what they do is just like a cat, they go backwards, and then when they're at the right position, they jump. Unfortunately, and I'll talk about this a little later on too, um, the jumping part is where a lot of young bears die or injure themselves because they haven't judged it right. Just like kids that are accident prone. Uh -oh. So the bear, other than a bowling ball, has a very round and bulky look. And the stuffed bear that I have here would approximate that kind of look. So when you look at it, you can see. But uh, it's because they have short, sturdy legs. And come and feel the fur on this at some point before you leave. You can see this, the length of this is probably about three to four inches or more, and very coarse and thick. And then under the, under the body, uh, they have a layer of uh, fat. So that's what gives them that bowling ball look. Without seeing the face, is this a young or an old bear? Young. Yeah. Yeah. Because the ears look very long, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. Gosh, I can tell you guys are going to pass that exam at the end with no problem. He's very, uh, the bear is, has a very long Roman nose. And as I said, most, uh, most have a tan muzzle and no shoulder hump. And here are the claws. You can see, you can see the, front, uh, the front paws. The claws are very round. And that allows them to hook into the tree very easily. And the back, the back paws are much straighter than can claw, but they're very, very strong. And if you, if you come and touch the claws on this, you can see how strong that is. He uses it for digging, um, for ripping uh, logs apart, and for, uh, he has to dig into the dirt for his denning, too. A bear doesn't have any, has a very short tail. It's only two inches long. So bears uh, are plantigrade, which means that they put their, most of their weight on their back feet, just like we do on our feet, on the back of the foot. And they're also waddlers, which means that when they walk, they put the feet on one side of the body, forward and plant it, and then do the other one. So they're constantly doing that just like a raccoon or a skunk um, are waddlers. Of course, when he's running, he's not waddling. <laughs> he's a bowling ball, correct. And uh, one thing that I found really interesting when I was researching this is that a bear has similar bone structure in its feet and its hands to a human being. And that law enforcement actually has courses on this to differentiate, so because errors have been made where people go, <gasps> somebody's died and it was a bear. Um, so the, um, the structure to the left in the top picture is the human being, and that's the bear. And the structure here is the human foot and the paw. A bear is an omnivore, um, and which means that it eats everything. And it has a full set of molars, canines, and uh, the canines are basically uh, for defense. It does hunt animals, but very seldom because, or very rarely, because it's slow. It can run fast, but only in fast spurts. 
so it doesn't chase things down. It's more of an ambush type animal. If you take your tongue and run it across your rear molars, you'll see, you'll feel, and see that they're very similar because we're omnivores as well. And again, if you come up and uh, check out the bear skull, you'll be able to see what those molars actually look like. A bear, bear's eyes are usually brown and it sees color because it needs to differentiate shape. When it's up there picking berries, it doesn't want to pick a twig or a leaf, it wants to get the berry. So it's able to differentiate color and shape. And it sees very well, twice as well, as, or much, much better than we do because of a um, membrane in the back of the eye called a tapatum lucidum, which takes the light and intensifies it several times within the eyeball. And if you've ever driven at night and see a deer or something, you can see where those, light, those eyes shine up. That's exactly the same thing. So they have extremely good uh, night vision. The hearing is much better than ours, twice as good, somebody said. I can't attest to that. And uh, the one thing that it can do is over a much wider range of frequency than we hear. Good posture. Yeah. yeah. He's in school. <laughs> so that's similar to dogs. Yes. Um, but the best. Uh, best one that uh, the best sense that a bear has is his nose. They have a uh, hundred times more smelling membrane area than we do. And of course, that nose gets them into trouble every time. They love to swim. Um, so if you have a pool, make it bear ready. Um, and uh, the mother takes the kid and the kids swimming quite often. Uh, they can swim up to a mile and a half usually on the average, uh, but in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, a nine mile swimming odyssey has been documented. So they're quite good swimmers. And the cubs, we'll talk a little more about it later, but I just wanna, I wanna give you an overview. Litter size is usually about one to three cubs. Uh, with four being rare and five being unusual. And if you think about it, that's logical because it's a big animal that needs a lot of food and a big territory. So if the territory, if the food isn't there, having five, having a, a litter of five uh, would probably decimate the food in the territory before they run into another bear that's also fighting for territory. Um, they weigh approximately half a pound when uh, at birth and about the size of a chipmunk. So they're very small. And uh, they reach se sexual mat maturity at uh, an average age of three and a half years, but that can range from two to six, all depending again on food and the ability to uh, mature in their territory. Um, cub mortality most years is around 20% but it can be as high as 50%, uh, again, depending if the food supply is adequate. A mating takes place in late May to July, and females give birth every other year, or even longer, depending on habitat conditions. But should a cub die, then the mother would actually uh, be able to give birth again, and sooner. What do you want to suggest? Ah, I knew you'd ask that, 63 to 70 days. So it's relatively short. And uh, birth is usually seven months later in January to early February. And the thing that's really interesting about bears is they have delayed implementation. Let me just finish this up. Uh, implementation where the fertilized egg doesn't attach to the uterus until she's, uh, unless she, uh, until she's hibernating. And usually, it allows her to build up body weight. 
and there's a natural kick in, if she doesn't reach 150 pounds minimum, the egg doesn't attach. Once she gets to 150 pounds, the egg attaches and then she's pregnant. So, yes, sir? Are, are the cubs born with fur? Ah, we'll get to that. <clears throat> Cliffhanger. <laughs> So there's a, there's a mom in her den with a bear. So 25 million years ago, bear dogs and Osidai split. I was there with a Kodak camera taking that picture. <laughs> And um, the reason, and the reason I bring this up is because bears are very much have very much some of the habits that dogs do, such as the mu muzzle grabbing, where you can see the wolves doing that. Pair, polar bears do too, and they roughhouse. They love to roughhouse when they're young, um, and uh, those habits come with your puppy dog or your puppy bear. I'm not quite sure who's got the better nuzzle there. <laughs> so the bear was originally descended from the Etruscan bear 500 million year, or 500,000 years before the present um, when it crossed into uh, North America. And the grizzlies and brown bears are also descendants from these bears, but they didn't cross until 100,000 years ago. Um, so, and as I said before, polar bears were thought to uh, derive from these, but they stayed near the oceans, and so therefore became the maritimus part of the race. Uh, brown bears are the largest man-eating, or meat-eating, sorry, <laughs> meat-eating carnivores in the world, and they live uh, throughout uh, North America, or, uh, sorry, Alaska, Europe, and Asia. The brown bear, or the black bear, uh, prior to coming to the Europeans, uh, prior to the Europeans coming to the continent, were throughout the continent of uh, North America. They were, had the widest range and the largest numbers of any of the bears. Um, and they also, um, estimated that their population was 500,000 to a million bears in North America. So that's quite a number. Currently, it's estimated to be five, uh, 750,000. And the reason we know this, or think we know this, or base it on stories, anecdotal evidence, uh, there was a Father Jacques Gravier, a Jesuit missionary in the Ohio River Valley, who in one day wrote down in his journal that he saw 50 black bears. So they must have been um, quite numerous. First Nations uh, have the bear in high esteem. Um, it's uh, strong, and the qualities of the bear that they see, they've adopted it as, as a god to them, or a, a good spirit, uh, size and strength. And also, uh, some thought that the bear was important because it was somewhat human, because it walked on its hind legs, and some of the bones resembled human bones, and also they seemed to um, like to eat the same foods that humans did, and would also kill other animals. So for them, the bear was very similar to what they were. And the uh, shamans, the uh, medicine men, um, would get their healing powers from the bear because the bear ate a lot of the herbs that the Indians used. The Cherokees also thought that the bear represented the, the division line between peoples and animals. So it was the, the dividing line. There were complex rituals when a bear was hunted and killed, but when the, uh, the uh, European settlers came, they were surrounded by all these wild big beasts, and so therefore they began killing them and uh, harvesting them for all kinds of things. And the bear had many uses from uh, the early 1700s to the late 1900s. 
up to 18,000 were sold in a year at the beginning of that era. And coats, rugs, blankets were made because they were sturdy, they were durable, and they were warm. Um, bear oil was also harvested, and uh, it was used as salad dressing. Um, hair restorer for those that barely had any. <laughs> and in cooking, and as a liniment, and also as a uh, perfume base. A typical black bear gives up 10 to 15 gallons of oil. So that was quite, uh, quite a good uh, harvest. Um, unfortunately, as in many things in the past, when there was conflict, usually the animal lost. And with large-scale logging, settlements and towns, the population went down, even to the point where in 1695, um, there was the um, Destroying Beasts of Prey Act. And that act stated that each Indian warrior must bring in one, uh, two bobcat pelts, or the pelts of a panther, a wolf, or a bear. And if in, in any case they did not do that, they would get a whooping. So, not to... Uh, the bear nearly became extinct. So, bear's biography. True or false? Bears can't run downhill. Mothers give birth in their sleep, wake up in spring, and oh my gosh, what happened? <laughs> Yes, true. Menstrual odors trigger bear attacks. False. Bears, black bears stink. False. Mother bear, black bears are more likely to attack. True. Mothers reject cubs with human scent. I don't know how you get close to, to put the mother <laughs> to put the scent on. Them. Okay. Bears don't feel pain like humans. Bears attack if they sense fear. True? When bears lose fear of humans, they're more likely to attack. No, this, this was the, this, it was false. So, it was thought that bears have very short front legs that they wouldn't be able to run downhill. In actuality, the reality is they can run any terrain, any direction, much faster than you would able, ever be able to run. I thought they might roll them. <laughs> oh, that could be too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could very well be. Either way, they're fast. They're faster, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so if you think you're going to escape them that way, forget it. Um, the metabolic rate when mothers are in, in hibernation, the metabolic rate is low, slowed down, but they do wake up and care for their babies just like any other mother would. Uh, number three, government brochures still state that menstrual odors will trigger bear attacks, although there has never been any kind of factual evidence of it. So don't believe everything you read. Some of it is fake news. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Most of the time, bears smell good. They groom a lot. They've got thick cur uh, fur. Nothing sticks on it. And unless something like a skunk comes along, they do a lot of grooming, so they smell quite fresh. Of course, I guess fresh is in the nose of the beholder. <laughs> um, number five, that is one of the biggest misconceptions. Mother bears are more, are highly unlikely to attack people in the defense of their cubs. They would most probably take the cubs and run with them or put them up a tree. And, and it's logical. All you have to think about is every time an animal stop, a big animal stops to fight, it's losing energy. And so it would much rather avoid the fight unless it's cornered. Um, as with young birds and other mammals, it is a total myth. Um, if they smell the human scent, that doesn't stop them from 
embracing their young. Um, in seven, bears don't feel pain, they do. Um, people, bears, dogs, and other mammals have similar nervous systems to avoid pain and protect their bodies from injury. So it's only a logical extension that they can feel pain, just like we would. And the one thing that is very amazing is that they react to very light touch. So if a bear is in hibernation in a den and you touch it, it'll actually come awake with a very light touch. Um, so bears attack if they sense fear. This is a common worry, but most people are afraid of bears and are not attacked. So if you see a bear, uh, you can be afraid. It won't come. <laughs> I'm not going to sign anything, though. Is this just black bears, like, or any bear? We're talking black bears right now. But, and I will touch on uh, the others in a, in, a, in a bit. And uh, so when bears lose fear of humans, they're more likely to attack. It's totally false. Researchers have actually found such bears are no more likely or may actually be less likely to attack um, because they know humans. So the cubs are born in uh, a snow-covered snow den. And here's the answer to your question. They're, they are hairless. Uh, they weigh between 8 and 10 ounces at birth and are about 8 inches long, fully clawed, blind. Um, and what they do is they uh, crawl to the mother's nipple and nurse while she curls around them to keep them warm. And a mother's milk, a bear milk, so the human and cow milk have a 4.1 to 4.9% fat content. A bear's milk has 30%. It's the second highest fat content in the world, where the gray seal, which also lives in very cold weather, uh, has 53.2%. So the, the cubs gain approximately 5 pounds by the time, so they start off with 8 to 10 ounces. And by the time they leave the den two months later, uh, they've gained five pounds, or up to five pounds. Uh, and they will continue to nurse up to seven months of age. So by their first fall, the cubs may range from 15 pounds on a bad habitat to 165 pounds of weight. And it's all dependent on the food availability within that habitat. So there they go, from fully naked to fully haired. And you can see here, the black bear, a lot of times this little white patch, um, black bears have that little white patch. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And uh, once they leave the den, they'll eat a variety of foods. And cubs, when nursing, will be purring. No, I did not do that, person, that research personally. And if they are in distress, they will cry, very similar to a baby's cry. And uh, when you have, uh, when you have a, um, an older bear, it continues to cry just louder. Isn't that true? And the mothers will uh, call their babies with a huffing sound. Uh, that it's exploding um, air from the expelling air from the mouth. Um, so, as I mentioned before, bears do a lot of mock fighting, just like two brothers, and uh, they have a whole bunch of uh, sequence. They have a definite sequence to that, where they start off by just pushing each other and then slapping each other, and then they might whop each other, and then they end up by biting. But the most important thing is the ear signals. Um, they take very good care not to hurt each other because this is just mock, but the ears uh, are important uh, for signaling. And if a bear puts its ears down, that is a definite signal, stop. And uh, they have they actually use five different signals, different positions, but the flattened ears is the most common one. And if one bear does that, the other bear would most likely stop and run away. So 
So during the first two years, bears might engage in this play every few, for a few hours every day. Mothers and cubs spend the first year and a half together. And since bears are solitary animals once they are mature, this is the only time that they actually have companionship and have any type of long-term relationship. Fathers play absolutely no role in the rearing of cubs. And as a matter of fact, males and females may spend two to three up to a maximum of five days together during mating, but after that they pay no further attention to each other. Uh, mothers seldom stray more than five feet from their cubs unless they've chased them up a tree. And usually when a cub is on the ground, the mother will make threatening sounds and actions to drive away the threat. And only some mothers may choose to attack. Remember I talked about, um, about the claws and that the black bear is an arboreal animal, meaning that it, it loves trees. So the black bear takes the, the tree as its escape route, and it will use a large pines that you see out in our woods as a nursery tree where it will park the, the bear up in the nursery tree and then go off and do what it needs to do for the day, come back. And so if you have an escape route, there's no reason to fight, no reason to attack. This is also, uh, this practice might also account for a 95% uh, survival rate for the cubs in the beginning years. And then the family unit that you see here actually dissolves when the mother goes into estrus in the second year. So they go their separate ways and might only meet again by accident. And the young females stay in the mother's territory or close to it, whereas the young males move further away. And that's where they run into problems. Because as they move further away from the territories across busy roads, they might get into other bears' territory, and they definitely come into contact with humans. And the mortality rate for young bears at this point, once the unit dissolves, can be as high as 50%. Uh, very few bears outside of national parks die of natural causes because of that. And nearly all adult bears die from human-related causes. Most are eventually shot, some are killed by vehicles. And in a hunted population, the lifespan is between three and five years, which is much, much less than the 30 that it's expected to live. Uh, bears less than 17 months old die of starvation, predation, falls from trees, or other accidental causes, just like kids that have accidents. And very few die of disease. So the bear is a very shy and solitary secretive animal. And you can see from the undergrowth why it wasn't until we had telemetry, radio telemetry, that we even knew that there was a bear there. Because they're very quiet, very shy, and they definitely hide out in thick underbrush. They choose habits, uh, habitats with good food supply, which means oak, black cherry, um, hickory. And then these are some of the common characteristics of the, uh, of the, of the properties that they have. Old farm lands that where the brush comes back in, and you've got that uh, thick cover. Their diet is varied and wide. And you can see here, I brought in a uh, wasp nest. They would find something like that, climb up into the tree, tree, pull it over, and actually start eating the larvae and the, and the wasps that they can get. Um, and because of their thick fur, their only exposed part is the nose. And so they don't, they don't really care about that. And of course, um, nasty habits. So I'm a beekeeper, and having seen that bear, I'm sort of worried about my bees. They also do domestic livestock, although very, very rarely, only in extreme needs of food or starvation. Bird feeders, though, are another story. And that's why 
they ask you not to keep the bird feeders up once bears come out of hibernation. And uh, I found this photo um, from where a bear got in for car service. Uh, pried the door open and climbed in, wrecked the car inside because people left their food. So I'm not quite sure if that's still current, but they do, when you go to national parks that have bears, they do ask you to put the food in the trunk and hide it. Yes? It's not only food, though. We found that it's like shampoo that smells like berries, and in hand lotion, anything that smells like food, you uh -huh. have to lock up and remove. It's yeah. like hand lotions, so it, it, anything that has that scent, they'll go after. Yeah, because they don't know. Um, yeah, and we were down in the Smokies uh, this past summer, and my, my daughter said, boy, I hope I see a bear. <laughs> and she apparently did. She went to the bathroom and saw two eyes. I don't know if it was, you know, that she had a great imagination or if she really did. Either way, she didn't go to the bathroom for the rest of the night. <laughs> So bears, uh, bears are very, for such a clumsy looking bowling ball, bears tend to be quite uh, delicate eaters. Uh, they will take their tongue and actually pick individual berries off the bushes. Or if the bushes, or if the berries are clumped, they'll just, like we do too, put them in between the teeth and then just pull it out. Um, and here you see where I had, uh, I had said, if they, they will climb into a tree, if you go into a forest that has beach and is remote, if you take a look at the beach bark, trees that are a little bigger than a foot maybe, you should be able to see some claw marks. And especially if that tree has a nice um, sort of nest or a fork in it. And what the bear does is it climbs up into that fork and then sits there and pulls in branches to it, makes a nest, and in that nest, then, we'll continue to pull in branches and eat the fruit, the nuts, whatever, off those, off those trees. And uh, the reason beech trees, I mentioned beech trees, is because beech has smooth skin, and so you can really see the claw marks going up it. Um, those claws that we talked about earlier on are also used here, where they'll roll uh, dead logs on the ground looking for insects in them, and then rip them apart to eat them. and <laughs> seldom eats debris, spits out the cords. I can just imagine it sitting there eating an apple going, please. <laughs> okay, Henry, it's your turn. Uh, or it just avoids them all together. But they tend to lounge. It doesn't seem like enough food for such a big animal. Yeah, you're right. You're right, I mean, it, it doesn't seem, but you know, um, I'm sure you've all heard, almonds are very good for you, but they're very fatty, right? They have a high fat content. And so it is with other nuts as well. And if you, I have a, a branch here that shows uh, the proliferation of nuts on it. And so if, they're, if they gather those, they can gather quite a bit in a, little, in a short period of time. Um, let me just go through this and then you'll see, I, I touch on that topic again. Um, bear signs, if you're walking in the woods, uh, here's, a, here's a split sapling, and that's exactly where the bear pulled it down to eat whatever was at the top. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a rolled log that's been ripped apart for the insects. Here's a uh, um, yellow jacket nest that was ripped apart. And you can see um, canines and where the, he's bitten with his front teeth and sort of chewed, didn't want to spit out the core. <laughs> he just wanted the apple. And this is what you're looking for on trees, the sort of four or five claw marks going up the side where he's pulled himself up. And also this is a nest where this guy was a little too heavy for that tree. So in a range, uh, the bear chooses a range depending on how much food there is, what the cover is, and what kind of denning sites, the quality of the denning sites. 
and the ranges can uh, vary quite a bit. But once decided on, they can be kept for many years, and uh, they have um, they might have a core site, a core range, and then because the neighbors got a good apple tree, they might just go over to that apple tree in the fall. But it's not part of their territory, nothing that they, they defend. Uh, for yearlings, year old bears, um, the territory is usually one to two miles. Adult females, two to six miles. But the male, eight to 15 miles. So the male definitely has a much bigger territory. And uh, excursions or day trips, probably longer than a day, have been of 126 miles have been recorded. So the bear can range quite a bit. And in terms of marking its territory, um, trails where bears tend to mar uh, march along a lot, there are usually bear trees. And uh, you can see uh, there's a, a lady uh, down in uh, Richmond that has quite a bit of property and does a lot of um, bobcat uh, work. And she also, she has a program called Keeping Track and she teaches people how to track animals and things. But she has bear on that property and we went out and actually saw where a bear bit a tree and where it rubbed and it had hair. And it's quite interesting to see. But these bear trees along these trails will be used as mileposts for years and years. And different bears will rub them and bite them and whatnot. And so they get used quite, quite a bit. So activity level, uh, and this, is, uh, this relates also to the food part. In springtime where there's, the food is just coming up and it's less nutritious, the bear eats a little bit and then sleeps part of the day. In the summertime where there's lots of food, now the bear is gonna be roaming around. That's when he patrols his territory, when there's mating uh, and eating. In the fall, he, will actually, he or she will actually eat uh, all day and most of the night and sleep very little because that's where they tank up for hibernation and then in fall they live off the fat uh, that they gathered up in fall. And it's in fall when they eat a wide variety of foods and they, you know, they can go from a blueberry patch to an apple tree to a whatever, nuts, and uh, if, the, if the mass is good, they should gain a lot of weight. Which brings us to hibernation. They are not true hibernators uh, because uh, they uh, don't, um, they do not undergo the same sort of extreme drops in body temperature and heart rates and metabolism that true hibernators do. Uh, true hibernators enter hibernation quickly and arouse slowly. Whereas the bear goes into hibernation slowly and arouses quickly. So, he will wake up quickly and normally within half an hour, a bear's heart rate will return to normal. Um, from, uh, I, I have the number a little later on, but it's, uh, it, it, takes, uh, it doesn't take him very long to get back to a, a normal state. The bear's hibernation is deeper than small mammals because it does not awake periodically. It sleeps right through. Unless it has a cub, obviously, and then it's sort of in a, a, a torpor. Uh, denning length depends on temperature and food availability. So this year, last year, if we think about winter, we didn't really get snow until January. I mean, we got a little bit in December, but so that would have been a long time, and if the mast was good, if the food availability was good, they would have probably not have denned until much later in the season. This year, food was good, snow was early, they don't really care about the snow, it's the food. So it's the food that depend, determines when they go into denning. Uh, also, the colder it gets. So now that it's March and it's 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> March and it's cold, the bears are probably still in their dens. Whereas on other years when we had warmer weather, they might have already come out. What's that? I said they're still in their den if they're smart. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> And again, it also depends on what the food availability is. Sure. Yes? If, if you're out in the woods and you, you come across a den, maybe accidentally, are you in any danger? No, the bear, the bear is, I mean, unless you approach it and try and wake it up or want to play with it, but <laughs> otherwise just leave it, the bear's there. Just yeah, right. No, I would, I would go with my friend and say, would you go pet it? <laughs> so, and then the, uh, the other thing too is that dens come in many different varieties, shapes, and locations. They can be under rocks, they can be in dead trees, um, they can be up to 30 feet above the ground, which when I heard that was, I didn't expect that. The highest one was found at 80 feet above the ground, the penthouse suite. <laughs> so, and dens are relatively small for such a large animal. So in actuality, if you look, it's just 35 inches, which is that much. So for a big animal, that's quite small. But if you think of it, it makes sense because if they're trying to keep temperature low, they don't want to keep putting wood on the fire, right? <laughs> Yes, they might, they might take advantage of something that's already sort of dug and dig it further, or they dig completely new. And if you go onto the web, onto the internet, you can actually, there's actually um, pictures or videos of bears digging their, their dens. So dens can be uh, hayline, like the one at the top there, in between rocks and leaves pushed in, uh, brush piles, uh, they prefer hay. So if they have a source of hay, they'll use that. And they will also build dens that are open air, like that. So George, you don't have to go looking very far if you want to find a bear. And that last one is very similar to a day bed that they make uh, when they go out on excursions. Uh, and of course in residential areas. So storm drains and uh, under crawl spaces, you might have a bear, who knows? Hibernation, known also as dormancy, winter sleep, copor, carnivorian lethargy. And what is so important about it, the body temperature falls just slightly but the metabolism goes from 55 beats, the heart rate, 55 beats a minute to nine. So that's quite low. And the body temperature goes from 100 degrees to 91, so a nine degree loss of temperature. Uh, and as it sleeps, uh, what it does is it creates a microclimate around itself. And the, the area that it loses the most heat is at its no a nuzzle, um, and so it, it will sleep with the paw over the nuzzle. And the babies, uh, the cubs, are pulled in and kept with the mother's body weight, uh, body. And she regulates her body temperature as she needs it. So the colder it gets out there, the more fuel she burns up, but she keeps the body temperature at what she needs. Um, she does not drink or eat, the bear does not drink or eat during hi um, hibernation, and will actually create what's called a fecal plug, which is made up of hair and plant fiber, and um, sort of blocks it up. And you can find those in the springtime outside of dens. So hibernation, five to seven months depending on the weather. So this year it's probably a long hibernation as compared to last year. Metabolism slows down, body temperature falls, heart rate. All of this is not very well understood. If you think of it, we've only been doing research since the 60s. That's not that long ago. 
And, but one thing that is very important is that as they do this research, they find, uh, they're finding things that affect weight loss and could also affect uh, strokes and heart disease of how to keep the brain alive and viable with the lack of oxygen. Because as the metabolism rate on a bear goes down, it doesn't lose any intelligence or brain function. So they're, they're doing a lot of research with that. And it's hoped that uh, more research will this, in this will bring some, uh, some clues to some of the problems we have today. This guy was enterprising. He's a yearly, you can see how big the ears are, by the way. So you can see it's a young bear. This is a yearling, and he was smart. He built his den right under that carcass. He didn't have to go far except for the porch for the larder. So springtime, whenever that is, uh, warming temperatures, longer days, melting water, smell of flowers, that's what the signal is, the alarm clock for the bear to head out. And a bear that comes out of hibernation has lost a lot of body fat. He doesn't lose any of his lean tissue, but can lose up to 20% of body fat. And that's why when they come out of hibernation, they'll eat anything and everything. Well, they might go to like a day bed or a, you know out of protection, but they won't go back into hibernation. My, my friends were hunting in Cambridge. Cambridge. Uh, Skull or uh, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, I guess. They they encountered a bear during hunting season, and it was drunk. It had the appearance of being drunk on it on its butt, and it was sitting on its hind, on its behind, and leaning against the tree, it kept falling off onto the ground and getting back up, and leaning against the tree, and they went back down, they got a camera, they went back up and some pictures of it, but it was a break in the weather, and, and couldn't figure out whether it was. Now, hunting season in November? Yeah. Well, it was deer hunting, you weren't hunting for bear. Right. So it could have could have been a, a university student in a bear <laughs> costume. One, two, most probably a bear that hadn't gone into hibernation yet, that had found some ripe apples that had yeah, rotted on the ground. The yeah, and uh, or uh, he went to the Stowe pub and had a good time. You know? <laughs> but yeah, that's. I mean, there are always outliers of things like that, and if they have a good food source. Um, They'll but be around. It breaks for the good, and they're only in partial hibernation, and, and there would be food gathering available. No, but, but the thing with hibernation is that they would not, they've already gathered the food, now they've gone to bed, and just because the weather gets good, they're not going to re, you know, they're not going to waste that energy. It's, if, for example, if they come out of hibernation, uh, they've gone through a whole bunch of stuff, now they're eating, then they might go for protection, but they'd never go back into a deep sleep because they don't have any food stores that they know that they're, gonna, they're not going to be able to. And to go into hibernation for one day takes longer. I mean, that span is too long. So, uh, yeah, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that uh, they're ravenous, Bird feeders, garbage cans, pet foods are stored away. Um, so bears and people. Bears will always stay close to trees. So when they're going across an open field, they'll zigzag along the edge of it, going from one tree to the next tree, just to make sure that it's got an escape route if something were to happen. And this is where someone had asked, is this only true for black bears? Grizzly bears are much more apt to stand and fight because they don't have, they live in areas that don't have any trees. They also are incapable of climbing trees because of their claws. So if you meet a grizzly out west, climb a tree because you're safe. <laughs> meet a black bear out east, don't do it. <laughs> So, and the black, and, and the grizzly says, look, if I'm under attack or if I'm under threat, I don't have any place to escape to, so I might as well stand and fight. 
And that's the answer to the question, black bear runs, grizzly does not. And most important, if you go into bear country, know the signs. That bear is saying, get out, get away, stop bothering me. And when you encounter that kind of bear, I mean, even his look, <laughs> his look is kind of mean. But if you encounter that, there are warning signs. The first one is a low moan, and he's trying to tell you. It's just like skunks. If you meet a skunk, it's not going to spray you immediately. It's going to stamp on the ground, and then it's going to circle around, and it's going to do a couple of things to warn you, because it doesn't want to engage. Same with a bear. Blowing sounds, woofing, Joe pot, and the thing that it's trying to do is it's trying to intimidate you, right? It's trying to say, I'm bigger and stronger than you, so if you're going to fight me, you're going to get hurt. Uh, it feigns attack. If the ears are up, it's kidding. It's a, it's a, I mean, I'm not going to stand there and see, right? But if it's not flattened, it's just running at you and then stop short. Uh, hind legs, swap the paws. Charge with the head down to stage four, flat ears. Now we're getting serious. And even at that point, it might just be nipping at you or snapping in the jaws. If that bear would have wanted to really hurt you, those claws would have been through, right? But what it's trying to do is move you out. Because if it engages, if a bear hits another bear and they're truly serious about fighting, then there's a lot of energy that's lost. And it's always an energy equation. So going back to that last slide, what should that person have done? Right here. Oh, okay. So when the bear says, like that bear in the first slide, stay away, the first thing you do is stop your annoying behavior, which might be anything from walking, right? Just stop. And slowly, retreat, but you're always facing the bear because you don't want to show him that you're running. Never, ever run. Just back up and keep looking at him. If the bear escalates aggression, no. If he escalates the aggression, don't panic, easily said, right? But what you still want to do is you still want to, and you might want to take your coat, if you have a coat, and you might want to do this. And you want to do the same thing the bear's doing you know, huff and puff and shout and do the reverse. And as they say, water pistol, squirt the bear in the face. If it gets that close, I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> but panic, panic is, a, and just keep thinking. The bear is trying to intimidate you. He doesn't really want to fight you. Be bear smart. Um, when we were in the, uh, in the parks, they always had containers, they always had, you didn't want it, if you ate your supper, you didn't want to leave anything on any of the grills or anything else, simply because you draw the bears in. Put it away in the garbage, take the five feet and put it into the bear, you know, bear secure garbage bins. So for the future, in the past, We've always seen bears as circus performers or in the fairy tales. Yogi Bear, Smokey Bear has brought us messages that we need to know. Uh, and of course, Pooh Bear. So are bears bad? Are bears good? Are bears part of our culture? They're entwined in all kinds of ways. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to figure out how we want to relate to the bear. The bear was even, and, and I have up here <coughs> the uh, Steip, the the little bear beside the. Uh, so just a, a quick history: the bear in the uh, marriage in the bridal gown was a bear that my my wife's godmother made for her, and she made several of the other bears, including the big bear. She used to make bears until she got sick, and the bear beside the bridal bear is my Steip from when I was a kid. So that's a Steiff bear that was originally made in Europe from, uh, not at the time, obviously, but it is a Steiff bear. When Teddy Roosevelt refused to shoot a bear, that then became the cuddly bear. There was a lot of newspaper stories and whatnot. 
and that's where the teddy bear arose. And nowadays, you can see there's a whole bunch of different bears. And I, I'm sure each one of you had a bear somewhere, right? The other extreme, he's a monster. And people think the only good bear is a dead bear. And others take it to the other extreme. You need to, you need to keep your distance. You can't, you can't feed them, you can't interact with them because that's no longer a wild bear. And a bear, the future of a bear is very good because a bear is persistent, is adaptable, can live in a wide variety of habitats, and it can live close and thrive with people. And the thing, the reason why a bear is so important is it's associated with a wilderness of which only remnants remain, and it reminds us of that wilderness. The bear is the spirit of the wilderness. So, and just in case the spirit moves you and you want to outrun a bear, watch this. miles an hour. <laughs> 